Sue Johnson Wilder is my guest today, and I am so looking forward to this interview. I was so, you were a few minutes late, Sue, and I was just, oh my goodness, I really want to do this. You're a star in my sky. You have been for quite a long time now. Um, I think I, I was reading your work when I did my master's degree, which is nearly 20 years ago. <sighs> I was at the Open University and you were involved with the Open University then, I think. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. We did a lovely series of books there. Yeah. Um, so this interview is all about maths anxiety. We're going to do this interview in four sections. So it'll be a series of four videos. My first question to Sue is going to be about defining maths anxiety. What is it and what isn't it? Then we are going to talk about how to help children with maths anxiety. I got a great question off uh, Facebook, which was, what's the best way to help lower maths anxiety without lowering expectations? So we'll talk about that. The third question in the third section of the video will be, um, can maths anxiety be a good thing? Which is often asked, and some people think is. And the fourth question will be another one from the Facebook group. This has come from Joe Bowler's Facebook group in America. Does ability grouping affect anxiety? Do pupils get some relief knowing that they're amongst people who move roughly at the same pace or does, it, does putting them into sets cause anxiety? So let's make a start with the first question. What is maths anxiety? Over to you, Sue. Hi, hi. Um, so, um, what is maths anxiety? It's a form of anxiety that's math specific, and most of us have anxiety. Um, it's a very natural process to have maths anxiety. To have anxiety, you um, you get anxious when you're meeting something new, when you're not quite sure of yourself. And your brain does a kind of assessment as to whether you've got the resources to deal with something. And your brain's very good at separating things into challenge and threat. Um, and maths anxiety arises when you have a lot of bad experiences of mathematics. Um, and I just want to explain that the brain doesn't really tell the difference between um, bad in the sense of physically bad. So some people have actually been beaten if they've been bad at maths or whether the, the, the bad experiences are social. Um, and some of the practices that are going on in schools at present um, create um, bad memories. So one example is when um, the year seven class is all standing up and the teacher asks them a math question and they don't sit down till they've got it right. And the last few um, are feeling socially humiliated at a time when they're feeling quite vulnerable anyway, because they've just changed to a new um, group, um, a, new, a new school, and they don't know the people around them. Um, and so that social, social humiliation um, gets interpreted by the, the brain as a social threat, as existential threat, if you will, um, and it builds up a library of bad experiences and, and starts learning to avoid such things or be very, very careful of them. So what we have to do is know a little bit more about how the, the brain um, processes information um, so that we can work out um, what, what sort of things are threatening and what sort of things can be, can be more challenging. Um, so one lady at Warwick um, coined a lovely phrase, she called it the maths monster. Um, we, we did a course at Warwick University for staff who identify as maths anxious. Um, and we called it maths with chocolate, because um, chocolate deals with most things, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the notion of a maths monster, an invisible maths monster, is quite powerful, I think, because most a lot of people don't experience um, a, a maths-specific anxiety, but about 30% or even more of the population do. And Dr. Marianne Trent said, when you're dealing with an enemy you can't see, it's hard to turn the threat radar down. So once you get really anxious, you stop being able to think. It'd be really helpful to talk about the hand model of the brain, brain Rebecca, if that would, would help colleagues understand it. Yes, go on. So um, Dan Siegel um, introduced the hand model of the brain. There's a lovely website um, where, where he explains it. But basically, if you think about the inner part of your brain as represented by your thumb in, in your hand, 
and then the rest of the cortex being your fingers over the top and the fingernails being the bit that does all the maths. When you, um, and these are two sides of your, your brain, if you like, so we're looking at half the brain. Um, when your brain's all working together in a state of calm or challenge, um, all the bits are talking to each other. But if you experience a threat, basically the cortex goes offline because the primitive part of the brain is trying to help you save your life. And if you're in that state of, of threat um, and your brain's trying to save your life, you can't process complex mathematical ideas because they've effectively gone offline until you calm down again. And it's a very powerful um, mechanism that's been in operation for 100 million years. Um, and we need to be aware of it because if, if you're in that state, you can't learn mathematics, you can't panic and do maths at the same time. Your brain's trying to save your life. It's as if the tiger's in the room. It's just going to bring myself back into view there. Yeah, that's a really interesting model. But the one that you introduced me to years ago, which has it really liberated my thinking, it clarified everything so much, was this one soon. <laughs> it's just so helpful that for most children, they've got a comfort zone for maths where it's just too easy. And if they're tired, it's where they want to be on an easy day. But usually they're actually bored being there. And then they've got this zone out here where the maths is just way too hard. And it's genuinely incredibly difficult. And they're just looking at it going, I can't do that. And if you're forcing me to do that, I'm, my brain's going to shut down. But they've also got a big growth zone. And this is a normal child. And we want them in their lessons to be in that growth zone where they're being challenged and they're exploring new, new ideas and making new connections. That's correct. I want to, I want to connect what I've just said to that growth, yeah. to that diagram. So, so when your brain's offline, that's in the red zone where you're, you're, you're feeling so threatened, you can't think mathematically. Whereas when you're feeling challenged and a little bit under pressure, um, any, any dealing with any new experience, but the brain perceives that it's got enough resources to deal with that, that's what the growth zone looks like. So we could also call it the, the challenge zone. But the child with maths anxiety, and I've come across them, so many of them over the years, mm -hmm. it looks like this. Yes. I had one this week. Absolutely. I had a child who, um, you know, I was doing some work where they were finding the areas of rectangles. And I just had some rectangles and, we, and some centimetre squared paper, and they were holding them up at the window, putting the rectangle over the centimetre squared paper and counting the squares. That this child could completely do that, but they'd come into the lesson and they would say, I can't do it, I can't do maths, I can't do it, I can't do maths, I can't do it. I was like, I've only asked you to stand up and go to the window and put the sheet against the window and put the rectangle over the top and count because I can't do it, I can't do it. <laughs> mm. That describes the, the, the problem really well. So they can't engage with what you're asking yeah. them to do because they've gone into the threat zone. Yeah, the anxiety And space. it's almost like this has almost disappeared as well at the extreme phase of panic or it's very, very tiny. This child yes. couldn't do anything. Yes, yes. Because yeah. she, her, brain, her, her inner brain is trying to save her life. Uh, so she so she either goes into fight, flight or freeze mode and she's in, in, in sort of fending you off and saying, I can't do it to protect herself. And I suppose another, I mean, that was actually a boy, but um, if I think about, girl, I'm thinking about a year, year nine student and with my children, um, I would always try and get them into the routine of homework because that's giving them independence and getting them to work away from me and my classroom as part of um, a, a resilient child. And where children were never presenting with homework, I would say at the very least, you can either tell me or write down why you're not. And it may be because your home life is chaotic. It may be because you're scared to try. I don't mind, but you can do that. That's your comfort zone. You can tell me why you couldn't do that homework. And I had a, a child who just, uh, she eventually wrote me down this thing. And it's when I open my maths book and look at the, squares on the page they started to swirl around and mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. and it's like I'm so glad you've written that because now we can begin to talk about that and we can begin to puzzle mm -hmm. out a way forward that's going mm -hmm. to work for you mm -hmm. and the ultimate contrast to this is when you get children who are like this and they just will try anything they're just so happy and they've got such confidence that it's worth try 
can throw anything at them and they've got strategies in place to deal with really complex situations even if it's just i've not got a clue miss where do we begin and they're demanding of the teacher and the, and the other children in the class too. just worth saying with that second diagram um that for example at warwick where i work yeah a lot yeah. a lot of students come having had that experience still yeah. with a fixed mindset for the belief that they're just good at maths they have the maths gift um and then they meet the red zone and they they might go blank or they might um be feel panicky or feel like they've got to the edge and because they haven't encountered that that red space they don't know how to deal with it in the maths context so i think for those kids as well we need to know about all three zones yeah now just before we leave this section on defining maths anxiety i want to list some of the things it isn't um and in my opinion it isn't dyscalculia that's no, why no. children have got real trouble learning maths even though they're really trying hard and are engaged and don't necessarily think that's an example to. of that because a lot of people with dyscalculia do develop maths anxiety but i've met a lovely lady a who's now a head of maths um, and she just understood somehow, despite what the teacher was telling her, that she just would need a calculator. And she was told she'd never do maths um, very well. She went off to do a degree in mathematics with her calculator, and she then became a head of maths. And when we had the, 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 the meeting, the other teachers who were quite keen on mental arithmetic said, well, how would you manage without being able to do arithmetic? And she said, I have a calculator. What do you do when it breaks down? I've got a spare one. <laughs> And it made me think about myself and needing glasses sometimes that actually you have to sometimes use technology to overcome a, 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 um, a gap in your brains or your body's um, capabilities. And for some people, they just need to be able to use a calculator because they can't hold the numbers in their head. And that's dyscalculia. Um, whereas with, break, with mass anxiety, um, that affects about, as I said, said, about a third of the population. Um, and and if, if a test, person with dyscalculia isn't picked up and they're constantly expected to do mental arithmetic, then they might develop anxiety. But yeah, the two things are overlapping but different. And it's also not exam anxiety because you can get kids who really enjoy their classroom maths and really thrive with it and then have total panic when it comes to an exam situation. Yes, exam or test anxiety is a separate concept. Yeah, and obviously it's not school phobia. But there's one other thing I want to talk about before we leave this section, Sue, which is that the younger the children get, the more complex it is to puzzle out the, the behaviours because it doesn't present like classic anxiety at all just in younger children, I find. So my, I've got children, or, or maybe... It, it's children of all ages thinking back, but children who have got defense mechanisms in place mm. and they aren't doing the maths. They're highly skilled at analyzing the teacher's face and trying to second guess what the teacher wants them to say. They're brilliant at copying and mimicking. They're brilliant at doing things and finding strategies for producing the right answers without trying mm -hmm. because they're scared mm -hmm. to try. Mm -hmm. but they don't see themselves as being anxious and they don't come across as being anxious. They're having a lot of fun and they're taking a life journey challenge. It's just not about learning maths because all the defences are up. Absolutely. So, so one of the symptoms of maths anxiety is avoidance. Yes, of whatever, in whatever way you can, can manage it. Yeah, absolutely. Would we call that masking where they don't present as being anxious because they're, they're using a, a masking or a diversion strategy to um we could call it asking um the, the other thing teachers see is bad behavior oh gosh yes um so we had one youngster who was told she had to do our course um and and she threw a chair which quite surprised the coach who was with me at the time but that's an example of of the fight in fight flight freeze isn't it yeah, we'll come to that, how to deal with that in the next section, mm. talk about it a bit more. But I think ultimately it brings us back to this, mm -hmm. because this beautifully captures the children who aren't necessarily showing classic anxiety in any way, but mm -hmm. just don't have this growth zone. Mm. They're not engaging with learning maths. They're either anxious or they're using some kind of strategy for not mm. getting round actually trying to engage. Mm. Mm. So this is, it is my most powerful diagram. 